Welcome back to Zatli Second Podcast. Today we are reviewing Joe Italia Stage 1, where Tali Pogacar almost won, but lost to Johnny Narvaez. But at least he did insane watts on San Vito climb, four minute effort. And Nachka is saying that it's one of the greatest short efforts of all time. Yeah, I mean, it was the first stage of the Giro d'Italia today, obviously. Uh, you know, not really a traditional first stage, like not, not a flat stage or not a time trial. It was actually quite difficult um, hill stage or like hilly medium mountain kind of range uh, that finished in Torino and the main or like the decisive climb of the day was uh, Bivio di San Vita 1.4 kilometers at around 10 percent it's actually kind of a very similar climb to La Redoute in Liège Baston Liège where Pogaccia went clear uh, obviously this year and Remco the last two years before it so yeah Pogaccia was the big favorite in the betting markets I think like he was one like do you remember how short he was I think he was below 1.5 for the stage I didn't check the odds for the stage but it, it's it probably yeah it was 1.5 1.8 because everyone knew he would try to be from the for, in, in the pink jersey from the stage one until the stage 21 probably and they already had had a bike ready for him tomorrow. Yeah, the pink bike probably with everything. Like even Canago made the golden bike, so <laughs> they are really yeah, lucky. Yeah. And it would be funny if he actually lost the Giro. Like like today, there was a chance where he he could have crashed after the San Vito climb, where he risked it even. So yeah, you can never be sure. But yeah, for the GC odds, he was like one point eighteen, like like something something crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I it. found the uh, the stage one odds as well. He was one point seven two for the stage, and oh, yeah. Alaphilippe Alaphilippe was the second favorite at thirteen, and Narvas, who won obviously, was actually twenty twenty one and the third favorite. Yeah, yeah so, so good. Yeah, it was one of Narvas was one of the favorites, but you know, Pogaccia was the all out favorite basically, and. You you also raced like it was uh, because they paced kind of the whole day. Didn't let the breakaway get far away. It was like the Kalmajan was I think the strongest rider from the breakaway, but it wasn't like a super super strong break. You know, around six men I think I can't remember all of them, but yeah, yeah. but UAE paced the entire day today, so they never really got away, uh, or not far away at least, and then. Uh, on the first lap of the BVO Dan San Vita was uh, UAE pace quite kind of hard around six point nine for four minutes in the in the draft for riders and I don't know if the some of the GC riders already dropped there or was it on Madalena? I think probably not because they well, yeah. like it was a short effort and their legs were kind of fresh and yeah right after that was uh, Madalena climb and yeah they're like a GC rider started they're dropping like flies. Like Mikael Bjerg was again like pulling like in 2020, 2020 yeah, to, to the France. To Hurkete where he dropped Adam Yates. Yes, on like the, the, he, stage 17. It, 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 insane, yeah. Pull like like riders like Diamond Arensman, Michael Woods, Roman Bardet, Florian Lipowitz, they all fucking dropped on 7%. Yeah. Yeah, Mikael but Bjerg like pulling. if you look at the watts, it's not it wasn't a crazy effort. Like it was around yeah. six point one for Four, yeah, 15, 15 minutes, minutes. thirty. Yeah, and it was also like consistent, consistent pacing for basically the whole climb. So, you know, it's just probably those those GC guys that dropped weren't just weren't in good shape. Um, you know, or, you always have yeah. that that some riders that you expect to do well at the ground or aren't in shape early or not for the whole race. You know. Yeah. So yeah, prob probably Lippo also was that. Yeah, they did the previous climb, the San Vito, like really hard. It was like above yeah, yeah. their like the, the, the threshold. Maybe they didn't have that good uh, position before the climb, and they wasted yeah. energy. And and when the Bjerg pulled, you you just need to yeah hold a high watts per kilo still. Yeah. So already Aronsman and Barde and Lipovic are like the main main favorites that dropped. They were all all three of them were in the top ten in the betting odds. Uh, especially Ironspan and Barde were, I think, even in the top five, maybe. Like yeah, they were, even, even at some point, top three. Even. Yeah, so yeah, really Barde was third actually, be right before the race in the betting yeah. odds for GC, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, those were the main main riders that dropped. But like, also like, I think it was like around twenty five to thirty riders at the top, and already by that you see that it can't have been the craziest pace because there were also some like, not the greatest climbers, let's say, still in the group. Um, but yeah. 
And then obviously uh UAE had only Rafa Mika left after the top of the climb. So it was hard to control the next like twenty kilometers, which was downhill and then like flat kind of. And the group actually got away with a few strong riders, especially like Damiano Caruso actually got away with that group, who's one of the GC favorites, obviously. I think also in the group was uh, Nicola Conchi, um, Giulio Pelizzari, uh, and a few more riders. I, I don't have the right list. Oh, yeah. Uh, Schachmann, Boden, uh, yeah, so it was a few riders there. They got away. They got around 20 to 30 seconds for uh, away. And even, I think, Garen Thomas also attacked, trying to bridge with uh, Mario Van Sevenant, but they weren't allowed to get away. And Conchi was the attacked again, got away before the final climb. And he had 34 seconds on the Pelton and 20 seconds on the chase group with Caruso and Pelizari. And of course, like Bogacci attacked right away into the final climb, like nearly after like 10, 15 seconds. I think he just, as soon as he, it was possible from his position, he attacked and rode obviously the whole climb at the front. Uh, Narvarez, Narvarez and Alaphilippe were right at the wheel at the start, but Alaphilippe had to let go shortly after, let's say. And they caught all the riders. And Narvaz actually survived, which is kind of crazy considering he had like a concussion in a, in a race recently, and I think like he he had to skip some races because of that and right, training as well. Yeah, I think he crashed in uh, Gent. But of course, game. he's in ab absolutely great shape now. Might have been, yeah, that might have been the one. Yeah, yeah, he crashed in Gent and uh, yeah, yeah, I saw this it was like really bad. <laughs> yeah, this was the first race since since that, and yeah, yeah, and he had but to. I had to skip the Ardennes races, so considering his shape today, he could have maybe like been one of the top riders there. And his contract is also running out, so we don't know if he'll stay with Ineos um, next year, but he's definitely a great rider, and if I was Ineos, I would be looking to keep him. Like He was already great in Tour Down Under, where he finished second, he won the Down Under Classic, he won the Ecuador in Road Race, six in E3, and now the Malia Rosa after the first stage of the Giro d'Italia because he beat Tadej Bogacci then in the sprint later on. Uh, Schachmann also came back. He was uh, only like five or six seconds behind the two at the top because he obviously was in the group uh, before them, which had like 13, sec 13, 14 seconds on the peloton. Yeah, like Narvaez maybe is underrated rider because uh, in yours, uh, they don't give him that many chances. Like last year, he won three stages in Tour of Austria and dominated there. Okay, it's, it's, it's a small race, but he completely dominated there. And yeah, if he would ride on, let's say, on FDG or other teams, yeah, where he might hunt for stages in Grand Tours, he probably would have won more more stages. Yeah, from breakaways especially. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's possible that he could have won more stages from breakaways. He won the in twenty twenty one. In twenty twenty, he won. His first Giro d'Italia stage against yeah. Mark Perun in the rain where Mark Perun had a mechanical after going crazy on the climbs and only Narvaez was able to follow. So he has already won one. And I think, like I remember in the Vuelta a España 2021, he did like a crazy lead out for Egan Bernal on the similar climb to the one that they raced today. I don't know if you remember. And then uh... Roglic dropped the GC riders and but like gave the stage to Magnus Court from the breakaway. Okay, yeah, I, I remember that because I think I had the bet on Roglic yeah, on that <laughs> stage. I remember yeah, that. It was in uh, mm. Cuyera, uh, Alto de la Montaña, the Cuyera uh, stage. I think. Ah, yeah, yeah, Montaña yeah. de Cuyera, yeah, 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 that one. Uh, yeah, so Norvice is kind of a specialist on, on climbs like this. Yeah, which is the reason and why he also it's... yeah he's really great in classics. Yeah, he is like really yeah, yeah, yeah. punchy guy. Okay, and what Pogacar did on uh, the San Vito climb, yeah, big watts I hear. Yeah, yeah, it was a great performance. Obviously, the stage wasn't very hard. If you look at the kill jewel, this was one of the easier Grand Tour stages as usual in the Giro d'Italia. But he did eight point seven four watts per kilogram for three minutes thirty four, which is almost the identical watts that he did on Murderhui when he won last year, but like for 
40 seconds more. So it was a really great performance. And comparing it to like uh, Cote Peak last year, who had a similar climate of stage one of the Tour de France, where we had Lafay, Pogaccia, and Vingegaard uh, in the first group. And there they did like 7.98 for four minutes 24. So it was like much less, uh, much less what's that they prove. Uh, yeah, produced there. So yeah, it's maybe an improvement. Maybe also Pogacar didn't go all out on the Cote Peak, or the pacing wasn't as great. But yeah, it was it's it's certainly a good sign for for Pogacar's shape. Although he didn't win a stage, obviously. Yeah, like I think the watts are great because uh, here because he went super hard from the beginning. He knew he needs to catch the front riders, Schachmann Group and Conchi. And yeah, like he, yeah, like he, he really badly wanted to win the stage. Like I'm reading after the stage, the atmosphere in UE bus wasn't that great, and also Pogacar wasn't in great mood because like they were <laughs> expecting like to win for 100 percent in that stage. But yeah, like practically, UE fucked up like on uh, Cipresa in Milan and San Remo, where like Mark Hirschi, Diego Lisi, and other guys like couldn't even pull. And they weren't in a great position before Chipressa. And yeah, right here, like they practically burned all their riders on the Madeleine climb. Like Grosh Hartner, Novak, even like couldn't pull or didn't do anything. And practically only Mike and Bjerg uh, lived up to expectations today, I think. Yeah, from UE climb climbing squad. So if they would say, yeah. let's say, yeah, guys, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe like I don't know who pulled the dual leaf parts, but like I think Langen actually performed kind of well because I think he pulled like a lot of the time, uh, to like keep the breakaway in check. But yeah, Novak was nowhere to be seen for most of the stage. Uh, Grosjean was nowhere to be seen, and this should also be a stage which suits him. So he really kind of underperformed. Yeah, like Novak was great in Liege, Boston, Liege. I remember, yeah, like he pulled for, for many clients yeah, and was. was strong. Like super strong there. Also, they didn't take Diego Lisi to Giro Italia, who did on Prati di Tivo in Giro de Oprut. So 6.41 <laughs> watts for 36 minutes. Yeah, break the Pogacar record. So they didn't took Lisi, who has won like almost, I think, 10 stages in Giro Italia. Like it, it's his race. And yeah, it's weird that yeah, they, didn't, something like, that. Yeah, they didn't take him Yeah, for some reason. Yeah, but I think Ulissi was like uh, not great in the yeah DNF in Liège, based on Liège, and DNF in La Flèche Vallon. Yeah, like but it was it really was like not great super there. Cold. Yeah, it was super cold also. So yeah, again twelfth in yeah, but still that might Frankfurt. be one of the reasons. Yeah, yeah, might be one of the yeah. reasons why they didn't take him though. What I do wonder, like we said that UAE maybe underperformed, but do you think that Pogacar could have dropped? Or won the stage if they had like better support because I don't know like Narvas was super strong it never looked like he was on the limit on the climb even though Pogacar was pacing super hard. Uh, I think they could because like Narvas like was barely holding on Pogacar's wheel and uh, if they could pace harder the Madeleine climb which was like 15 minutes 30 seconds let's say they do it one minute faster and Narvaez, Narvaez isn't like a specialist on long climbs. Maybe they cook his legs there like more. And then he couldn't, let's say, drop drop that many watts on Servito, yeah, I think. Because also Pogacar did the the, 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 the yeah. like the short climb alone completely, like without a lead out anything. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that they like if they could have paced Madalena higher, that would have definitely helped against uh Narvaez because he's obviously not a long climber or like more a puncher than a real climber. But I don't know, like even if they are strong, I don't know if they pace Madalena faster or if they wait for the final climb and to control the valley because I think a lead out on the final climb wouldn't have changed anything. I don't think he drops Narvaez there. But yeah, we'll yeah. never know. Maybe I I do Possibly. wonder if. If Yui is, is stronger tomorrow, though, because they will probably try to control for a stage win again, so Pogacci can take the pink this time. Let's see if they can perform on the final climb. Maika, I mean, that should be expected that he'll climb well, but the rest of the team is a big question mark at the moment. Yeah, like tomorrow the stage finishes on, yes, Santuario di Europa. Yeah, the climb where Pantani holds the record, and... Uh... 
probably yeah I'm, I'm seeing the climb and yeah it's not that regular at least the first part is yeah five percent three percent but the steep part is yeah starts later after the first five kilometers so let's see if they can break the Pantani record which, which they might if, if Pogacar goes all out early and yeah probably will break this record maybe yeah, it has to be said that it's not like one of Pantani's most impressive climbing performances. Like it's a really strong performance, but compared to like his peak years, it it might have not been one of his best. Like compared to 1995 or 1997, 1998, the watts in 1999 were not that high uh, because of the Festina scandal, I assume. But still, it's a it's a hard record to break. I think it's really on the limit where. It might be possible if everything goes right, but everything has to go right for for Pogacar to break this record. He would have to produce one of his best ever climbing performances. The wind would have to be kind of good. And the team would have to be strong. So we'll see if it's possible. I think he'll go a bit slower. Yeah, does he need to do like 7 watts per kilo for 70 minutes or something like that for Pogacar to break the record tomorrow? Yeah, probably. Like Pantani did 7.11 watts per kilogram for 17 minutes four seconds and that was already like he already had a 6.9 kilogram climbing bike at that point so yeah he'll definitely have to do a similar similar watts to Pantani maybe a bit less because Pantani didn't draft a lot because he had mechanical before the climb had to chase all the riders so maybe if he can wait a bit longer if the team is really strong it's maybe possible for Pogaccio to break this record, but as I said, it's it, it would need to be one of his like best ever performances. Yeah, probably I think he, he will do better than Tom Dumoulin in twenty seventeen. But yeah, we'll, yeah, he'll be really close to Pantani probably. But we cannot cannot underestimate Pogacar because he might be at his best shape ever, and yeah, might like after today, like it, it's like a fuel for him. Like he lost to Narvaez and Schachmann and really badly wants to win the stage because like he's the <laughs> the biggest possible favorite in Grand Tour history particularly before this before the race yeah like <laughs> yeah I don't remember a, any guy who had the like lower odds before any any Grand Tour like like it must have been like someone like Lance Armstrong or Eddie Merckx or like in, in those times like nah like not maybe. not even like Lance wouldn't I don't think Lance would ever be distorted for the Tour de France like yeah. I don't think he ever was. I don't. I don't have the odds in my mind. Like I don't know them, but I can't. I, I don't believe that he was ever this short. Yeah, because it, you it could also been, never, yeah. could also never have been as sure with his shape as like current days because he never performed before the tour. Uh, so yeah, it was hard to be as sure as we are about Pogaccio now. Yeah, because there also like aren't like any great GC riders here. So yeah. Yeah, you would need to look look, look for like maybe Walter Spagna or Giro Italia, like maybe Giro Italia at the Americs times probably. I think those all in yeah. those times in Giro the the strong guys were starting, but yeah, like in modern times, yeah, and this might have been like the yeah, Pogacar is, is the biggest favorite ever, yeah, for this yeah, it, yeah, race. Yeah, that is very likely at least. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks for listening and probably also we will be we will be back tomorrow with yeah, another yeah. pod. Maybe. With Giro and maybe also with the Vuelta women's. Oh yeah, yeah, all the three stages. <laughs>